from the majestic cliffs of the coastline to the rocky shores and beaches, from the ancient fishing villages to the beauty of Pololu and the home of Kamehameha the Great. This is North Kohala. In ancient days, the district of North Kohala was part of a larger moku of Kohala, which included Waimea, Kauaihai, and Waipio. That the translation of Kohala is sweet breath of the sun. Ko for sugarcane, sweetness. The ha, the breath of life. And la, the warmth of the sun. Putting all these elements together, sweet breath of the sun translate to prime agriculture land. So Kohala is the egg land that is prosperous. Today, the smaller moku of North Kohala stands at the northern tip of Hawaii Island and is geographically considered the oldest part of the island. North Kohala is divided into dozens of smaller land districts, or Ahupua, and is very diverse with both a windward and leeward side. The windward side begins in the valleys of Avini, Waimanu, and Pololu, and is known for its abundant rainfall and fertile lands. The leeward side is much drier as rainfall averages range from more than 150 inches per year on the windward side to less than five inches annually on the leeward side, creating vast diversity in the area's vegetation and topography. Some scholars say that North Kohala was inhabited as early as 300 AD. Mookini Heiau, near Opolu Point, is said to have been built as early as 450 AD. Some say it was built by the great chief Pa'au, who brought the kapu system to Hawaii and used Mookini as a luakini heiau, or a place of human sacrifice. Others say different parts of the heiau were built at different times, with Pa'au adding to what was already there. To ancient Hawaiians, water was considered wealth, and so North Kohala, with its fertile soil and abundant water, was an ideal area to call home for both royalty and commoners alike. Some estimates say as many as 30,000 people lived in the area before Western contact in the 1870s. Captain George Dixon noted in 1787 that most of the population chose to live in small villages on non-agricultural land near the shore or clustered around bays where the air was warm and dry. Fish and marine resources were nearby and plentiful. These coastal dwellers also cultivated the moist uplands, which they reached by trails several miles long. When, when, when you look at pre-contact Kohala, that these were people who were very much in touch with the land. They saw in this district Everything that they needed to thrive, they had, they had the wetland valleys, they could, they could irrigate the low E. You, you, you drive over, over, the, over the mountains and you see the cooler fields that extend for like five or six miles. And I think about our Hawaiian farmers with just one tool, a, oh, oh, a wooden digging stick, cultivating miles of sweet potato of special kinds of taro, of banana, and ulu. And then, when I was a boy, I used to go fishing. And how many times we, we camped down along Mahokona, going towards Kawaii on, on that, the leeward coast. Quite different from, from the windward side. And there are still, till today, there are still you know, about a dozen ancient Hawaiian villages there. They were part of that environment. They were not separate from it. And it was so simple. Aloha aina, you take care of the land, the land takes care of you. They, they saw themselves as part of everything they saw. The rocks, the trees, the earth, the plants and animals, the fish. They were all part of one grand family. 
An example of this way of life can be seen at Lapakahi State Park, an ancient fishing village that dates back over 600 years. Focused primarily on fishing, the village was built around an accessible shoreline where canoes could come and go and where there was a fresh water spring for watering crops and drinking. Most of their food was fish and other things from the sea. They also produced salt along the shoreline. You can still walk through this ancient village today and almost feel what life was like. This traditional way of life was developed over centuries and was centered around family and community. In the old days, they worked as a village. They didn't work like today, I'll do my own here, you do your own, we do our own. They worked as a village. The men, they would till the soil and everything, so when they're planting like whatever, tarawa, the men go down, they, after they dig all the holes, they put the, or they dig the holes, the women lay the whatever in, and the kids come by and step it up, and step it all in place. And you know, they show them how to hold it up and stuff. And so that's how they, they raised enough for every one of them. Wherever they had the water, they had the tarot patches, they had the lois. Whatever they had, or they raised the fruit, they would come down and exchange with those that had the fish and near to the ocean. That's how they lived. They had bought it and they shared with each other. If you had chickens, you know, just trade. And that was how they, they grew up and, and raised their own families at that time. Perhaps the most significant story of old from North Kohala is the story of Kamehameha the Great, who was born and raised in the district. Today, the original statue dedicated to the king stands in the town of Kapa'au, at the site of the old courthouse. Before he was born, there were prophecies that pointed to him as the future king. It goes back to his mother, Kikuapu Iva, who was a princess of Koala. She was a Koala royal family for generations, even before he was born. There were signs, there were signals, there were prophecies, and, and the, the one that stands out the most, especially, you know, when, when, when I, chiefess is pregnant with a child. You know, everybody begins to speculate about that baby. When she was pregnant with Kamehameha, she had a craving for the eyeball of a tiger shark. And so the kahuna, the, the prophets and the seers, had a field day trying to figure out what that meant. And they came to this conclusion, to eat the eyeball of a tiger shark, you had to kill the tiger shark. And for them, the tiger shark was more than just a fish, this big fish in the ocean. He was indeed the Ali. And to eat his eyeball, you gotta, you're gonna kill him. So they all come to this conclusion. This baby is gonna be a slayer of chiefs. Because of these prophecies of Kamehameha becoming a slayer of chiefs, Alapa'i Nui, the ruler of the island at the time, issued a decree to kill the child. And amidst all this, there's this Kikuapu Iba. What am I gonna do? Oh my God, what am I gonna do? Well, I'm gonna do everything I can to make sure that my child will not be harmed. Who can I trust to help me do that? Ah, Naioli. Chief Naioli. Kohala born, bred, raised, loyal, respected, he's the guy. So when Kamehameha is born at Kapakai Kokoiki, he devises a plan and he enlists the help, the Kokoa, from the thousands of people who live in Koala, where he, he took a very devious route from Kokoiki and, and, and to Avini, and where Certain people were entrusted to do certain things to help him. And that's how the Koala place names came to be. Because everything that happened as they moved across the district were commemorated by names like Ho'ea, Havi, Honomaka'u, Kapa'au, Makapala, Halaula. Well, you begin with Koko Iki, yeah? Koko, blood, 
ike, a little bit, a little bit of blood, and that's what happens during birth, doesn't it? The first stop he makes along that route is at Ho'er. There was a village there. What does it mean? It means to arrive. Finally, finally, it's about time you got it. Ho'er. Havi is the breath of famine. Ha, vi, famine. The breath of hunger because the wet nurse was in there and they had to feed them something so they got edible insects, got the soft parts of the body and fed it to him. And then the next place is Honomako, shelter your fear. The men are scared. We're gonna get caught, we're gonna get killed. All of us will be slaughtered. And Naioli, who's leading them, is trying to say, fellas, stay cool, don't panic. Kapa'o, the streams are swollen. Water is flowing, and they have to walk through the streams. They gotta wade through these streams, swollen streams. So they wrap him in his kappa, make sure he's nice and snug, and the kappa goes through the streams. And in Hawaiian, wading, swimming, bathing is ao. So they commemorate that by giving that place name kappa ao, the place where the kappa went swimming. Who's kappa? Kamehameha's kappa. The other, this next area is where I was, I was, I was born and raised. Halaula, it's a blood fault, the kind that you get killed for. If Alapai Nui ever figures out that the whole district is conspiring against him, he will not hesitate to kill all of us because it is a Halaula. But his next place is Halaba. Again, the breath of life, ha, lava, adequate, sufficient, plenty, lava. You know, it's almost like halfway to Avini. And so the question is, how is the baby doing? How is going to, ah, ha, ha, lava. He's, he's fine, he's, he's thriving, he's, he's breathing good. He's, yeah, his breath is sufficient, adequate, ha, lava. In the next area that has a name, Maka Pala ripe eyes. This is the description of the warriors who are now pursuing. And you know, they gotta find this baby and they've been searching maybe for days and sleepless days and nights, you know, just looking for him. And of course, I love the term Avini. Avini, where the, the destination is, is, is in a very inaccessible area. And when he gets there, his attitude is Avini. Come on, Alapai Nui, let's see what you got. We're here. We got Kamehameha. You want them? Come get them. Come get them. Let's see what you got. Give us your best shot. Avini. You know, it's like, I dare you. And so when, when you see Kohala in its entirety, and you look at its place names, what a wonderful message, right? It's a proud people telling the world what they did telling everybody what they did to save and nurture the greatest Hawaiian we ever had, Kamehameha. Kamehameha's original name was Paiea, meaning hard shell crab. When he was five, he was given the name Kamehameha, which means the lonely one. And that is exactly what his life was like, as he was raised in faraway Avini and Polulu Valleys. When he was five years old, Alapa'i Nui had a change of heart and brought him to live with him in Hilo. Hilo is also the place where Kamehameha fulfilled a legendary prophecy by lifting the Naha Stone, a 5,000 pound stone that still sits in front of the Hilo Public Library. The prophecy stated that the one who could lift the stone would unite and rule over the islands of Hawaii. The prophecy would be fulfilled years later as he rose to power, taking control of Hawaii Island in 1791, and then all the islands of Hawaii by 1810. Throughout his life, Kamehameha would return to his family's ancestral lands in Halava, where he had his own personal taro patches. He also loved the beaches of Keokea and Kapanaia. Today, there are still connections to North Kohala, such as the legend of Kamehameha Rock. It is said that Kamehameha carried the rock from Kapanaya Bay to Halava. 
years later, when it was being moved, it fell off a truck and landed along the highway. The story is that they picked it up and moved it, and yet the next day, when they arrived, it was in the same place in Halava. Thus it was decided to leave it in place where it sits to this day. Perhaps the most famous memorial to Kamehameha is the original statue honoring the king that was made in Italy but lost when the ship bringing it to Hawaii sank off the Falkland Islands in South America. Miraculously, the statue was recovered and in 1883 was dedicated by King Kalakaua in a huge ceremony at the Civic Center in Kapa'au. During Kamehameha's time, radical changes took place in our islands. In 1779, Captain James Cook sailed into Kealakekua Bay and began an influx of Western ways and influences. The flood of new ways, alcohol, and disease took a tremendous toll on the population. The sandalwood trade was also a huge disruption as it began a period of taxes on the common people and took them away from their daily way of life. In 1819, Kamehameha dies and his son, Liholiho, takes over the throne. The kapu system is abolished by Liholiho, Queen Ka'ahumanu, and Queen Ke'opualani. The Kahuna Nui, or High Priest Heva Heva, leads the change with the destruction of heiau, or temples, dedicated to the old religious system. In 1820, the missionaries arrive in Kailuakona to find a religious system overturned and society in a state of change. Over the next 20 years, the missionary influence would spread throughout the islands as they built churches and schools. There was a missionary named William Ellis led a circuit of uh, Hawaii Island looking for population centers where new mission stations might be formed. And at that time, the Kohala population and area uh, were looking for the influence of the missionaries in terms of schools and churches. And they asked for uh, a minister to be sent to Kohala. In 1841, Reverend Elias Bond and his wife Ellen were sent to take over Iole Mission and Kalahikiola Church, which had been started by the Reverend Isaac Bliss. Reverend Bliss had just finished building a tiny structure in the property next to the church, and so the Bonds moved in there. Ellen was about six months pregnant with their first child, having uh, sailed for three months aboard ship in her pregnancy. Kalahikiola is the name of the hill that the timber was gathered from in order to build the first church structure. And that was a wooden church. The frames were hewn from the ohia that had been gathered. And then coal wood was actually purchased from the mill in Waimea and hauled down to Kauai and put on into the water and floated out onto the, to the ships. And the ships would pick it up by, with ropes and small cranes or by hand. And they would sail up to Mahukona and throw the wood back in the water where it was floated to shore and members of the congregation would carry these boards two men at a time 10 miles or so from Mahukona to this location for the construction of that first Coalwood church. They completed the church in 1847 and when the church was not quite a year old there was a huge Kona storm came blowing up and blew the church down. And this was just before Christmas in 1848. And they cleared away the debris and sat on the floor and cried and prayed and determined that they would rebuild a new church and that they would not seek help from any outside sources. They would do it on their own. In the next five years, the community raised the funds and materials to build a stone church that was dedicated in 1851. Over the years, the Bonds built much more than a church, and it's commemorated in what is now called the Bond Historic District. The Koala Girls School, Kalahikiola Church, and the Bond Homestead are all collectively now registered as the Father Elias Bond Historic District on both the state and national registries. Education was a big part of the Bond's mission, and they ran a boys' school out of their house for over 30 years. They also used the house to train teachers that would end up at the schools that they would build throughout North Kohala. In the history books, he's credited with building, I think it's 42 schools and 38 churches. But actually, because of the shift in the population, 
Folks would move away from a valley after a disease had rampaged the population, and the survivors would go live with family in other valleys, and these buildings would sit empty. So they would tear them down piece by piece because materials were precious, and move them to where the new population had grown, and rebuild the same building to have the school during the week and a church on the, week on the weekends. In the 1840s and 50s, life was changing and people started to leave North Kohala for places like Honolulu, looking for employment as the traditional way of life was no longer working. To keep the population from leaving, because this was his congregation, and he also recognized that a lot of the women and children were being left behind, and they had a hard time caring for themselves without the gardens and the, the husbands to do the heavy work. He knew that industry was needed in Kohala, and Father Bond decided that sugar was the crop they were going to grow. With his own money, he purchased 200 acres and partnered with Castle and & Cook and neighbor James White to form Kohala Sugar Company. Although not profitable right away, the plantation made payroll and employed the local community. Eventually, it made a profit, and with the money, Reverend Bond and his wife started the Kohala Girls' School. By 1874, when the plantation uh, was able to provide the money, Father Bond went ahead and dedicated it to the building of the school. The girls' school remained active all the way until 1956. For almost 50 years, Reverend Bond and his wife left a tremendous legacy of ministry, education, and employment that touched thousands of lives and forever changed North Kohala. In the 1860s and 70s, sugar began to take over as the number of mills and plantations started to dominate the landscape. After the signing of the Reciprocity Treaty with the United States, sugar became profitable and there were six mills uh, operating in Kohala at one time, harvesting the cane from over 30 plantations. I think we had 33 at one time of different sizes. A plantation might be less than five acres, but all of the sugar somebody grew would go to be pressed for the cane juice. And then the juice was processed into raw granules or molasses and shipped out to other islands or to the West Coast for processing. With over 30 plantations, the industry needed an efficient way to ship their products so a railroad was built from Niuli'i to Mahukona. The railroad also became a way of life for people to get from one part of Kohala to another when cars didn't even exist yet. Mahukona became the central transportation hub for people, sugar, cattle, and all types of products coming and going into the district. This is the foundation of the warehouses that the sugar uh, bags were stored and so when the sugar boats came in and docked outside, then the conveyor belts would start and they, the workers would throw the, the sugar bags into this conveyor belt. And then the sugar bags were hoisted, put it in wooden boats, and then hoisted out to the ship where they were placed into the ship. And so that happened all day. The expansion of sugar also meant laborers were needed so workers were brought in from Japan, China, Portugal, the Philippines, and other countries. These workers were housed in camps spread throughout the plantations. Drought in North Kohala had been a significant problem, so in 1904, work began on what became known as the Kohala Ditch. Stretching over 22 miles from deep within the Kohala Mountains, all the way to Puakea Ranch, the ditch took two years to build. It was a treacherous undertaking, with 17 workers killed during construction. When it was completed, the plantations now had a dependable source of water, and sugar production grew dramatically, bringing prosperity to the district. That became the economic engine because we could sustain ourselves with the amount of water that, that was needed for growing and, and processing sugar. That water is important to us. Without water, there is no life. Maka vai vai. The ditch is still in use today, supplying water to local farmers and as a tourist attraction. In 1937, the different mills and plantations merged under the name Kohala Sugar Company as the mills and surrounding camps 
became the center of a thriving North Kohala community. For those that grew up on the plantations, life was difficult, but good. I was the youngest of uh, seven children, and my, my mother died when she was, uh, I was like two years, a little over two years old, and so I was left without the mother. So my dad, I guess, being the youngest and nobody to take care, he used to take me to work with him. And those days were, you know, the plantation days were all with um, horses, you know, plow with the horses and whatnot. So I remember him taking me to work and putting me on this plow and, you, you know, driving me through the cane, uh, cane field. And I remember when the, the Luna, the bosses came, one of the bosses came and he told me in Japanese uh, to hold his bridle. You know, they're steering the bridle because I'm sitting on the plow. He hold his bridle and he says, um, don't make noise, don't say anything, don't make noise, just sit still. So I just had that in my mind and uh, I know he went out, but my, the horse started to pull his tail up and uh, I know what was coming down, but that was funny. But so I think the, uh, the Luna knew that my father was taking me to work, but you know, being him, he didn't want to show that he was taking a small little baby to work with him. So he put me away, so I said, oh, so you stay still. And so even whatever happened, my father said, don't make noise and sit still. So there where I sat. We lived in Niuli'i, across of the Niuli'i sugar mill. Grew up there and I remember many things. I remember growing up there and how I, the cane trucks, the train, the mill, the whistle that it blows, it, would, it was just thrilling for us growing up there. And when they had to burn the sugar cane, the fields to clean the rubbish off, it was the biggest thrill that we could get to the cane and chew it, you know. All of us, the whole neighborhood of kids, we all did that. Or would ride on the flume, would haul it to the mill, and it would pass our home, the mill was passing, I mean, the flumes would pass. We would all jump on it and get cane for ourselves right on, you know, right at our hand, you know. As we grew up, we loved each other. Our parents were dear friends too, and, um, we didn't know what the word poor was. We were all equal. We loved each other, we played, we had enough to eat. Our parents, you know, gave us, and we were really well off to us, all of us. We just grew up that way. During my time, this was the economic capital. Right behind me was the largest sugar mill, probably in the state of Hawaii. This was the Kohala sugar mill. Everybody in Kohala worked here. In the mill, out in the fields, harvesting, planting, taking care of cane, bringing it here to have it milled. This is where my father worked. This is where a lot of my friends worked. And it was indeed, you know, the economic engine for all of Kohala. Uh, we played in the mill. There was no rules like OSHA. You know, us kids, we ran. When the mill was closed on Sunday, we ran all over the place. Right behind me, believe it or not, where you see all those banyan jungle trees was the most beautiful theater on this island. It was called the Kohala Theater. This theater was built in 1941, just before the, the Second World War. And this was the entertainment capital of Kohala. On Sundays, no matter what was playing, everybody came to the movie right here. And you can see how gorgeous it was back in 1952. Nine cents, nine cents. Popcorn, five cents. For 15 cents, you had a beautiful Sunday matinee plus all the entertainment. For 15 cents. That was a good old plantation days. A sugar mill has its own aroma. And it's, it's, not, it's not a bad smell because it, it was the smell of the economy. It was sugar being made. You know, you go from one end where the sugar came in and you could smell a little sour, you know, sugar was in the ground for the cane. And then as the sugar cane was processed, 
you could, you could feel and smell the warm brown raw sugar coming out. And it was, anytime we wanted to get a snack of you know, sugar, we just went down to the bottom with the sugar. We knew exactly where to go, to scoop up handfuls. Yeah, it was lovely. Na kupu no keo, na kupu no kapo, e ho mau iki ola o ko pula pula e, pali kapo puka ikeo, veli na mai ana koma koleo e, aloha e, aloha mai e. This is Mahukona. Hawaiian camp where I was born and raised and in the when I was growing up here there were just six houses that was situated in a circle and to connect each house because it's so rocky uh, we had boardwalks that started from here and went in the center and connected all the homes together however the unique thing was uh, in the center was the the outhouses and some homes had toilet and shower and other homes didn't so we also had an outhouse shower and a toilet facilities and at the end of the day uh, when all the work was done all the housewives all the women would congregate sit on the steps of the outhouse and exchange information with one another. This was a wonderful place to grow up where everything was so quiet and peaceful. No matter which plantation area you lived in, they always separated um, the people. So even in Mahukona, we had a Hawaiian camp. Right here we had middle camp with uh, a few houses. And then that area, we had Japanese camp. And there were about a dozen uh, homes there. And so all the Japanese would be in that area. But being that we were such a small community and we all, they all worked together, you know, so we interacted with, with no problem at all. You know, we were in their camp, they were in our camp. When we had luau's, uh, parties, you know, it was just one ohana. So that's the beauty of living in a small camp uh, society. Sugar would go on to flourish in the district until the 1960s, when environmental laws and rising wages for employees diminished profits. Castle and Cook closed Kohala Sugar in 1975, which took a huge toll on the community. In the mid-70s, they announced that they were going to close the plantation. And so that was uh, really a uh, hardship on the community because I think there were going to be a little over 500 people at least that were going to be out of job. The state tried to jumpstart new businesses to help fill the void by forming the Kohala Task Force, which started six businesses in the area. Today, only Kohala Nursery is still in business. Besides sugar, another industry has had a long history in North Kohala, the cattle industry. In 1793, Captain George Vancouver gifted King Kamehameha with six head of cattle. Over the years, the king would put a kapu on killing the cattle and they would flourish in the North Kohala countryside. When we talk about ranching, the first ranch that Parker Ranch started was in Waipuka um, with, with uh, a small acreage that he had, you know. So ranching from its get-go and the first start was in Kohala. And that's why maybe we call ourselves Kohala Cowboys. Since that time, cattle have been a part of North Kohala. One of North Kohala's most famous cowboys is Masa Kawamoto, a Medal of Honor winner with the legendary 442nd Battalion from World War II. Masa owned his own ranch and slaughterhouse right in North Kohala. A book at a house is his now. In the back used to be my corral back there. We used to raise all the cattle, brand all the cattle back Yeah, plenty. The cattle used to go. The pasture used to be all down. 
way down to to Mahokona, that's where the boundary fence was. Then we used to drive the cattle all the way back up. So planting cattle used to be about three, four hundred cows. Masa also won numerous races and contests throughout the islands. I used to call them icing. One year we took them on Lulu, we went on Lulu, yeah, yeah, and we won on Lulu too, yeah. So I get one trophy of this horse, the grand champion, yeah. Today, there is a new generation learning about ranching in North Kohala. Kahana no Iao, a program of Partners in Development Foundation, is a nonprofit organization focused on mentoring and is teaching high school students ranching and saddle making as a part of their program. For Kahana no Iao, it's all about passing down knowledge and values to the next generation. Mentorship of kids became really, really a high focus in our community because we were able now to preserve some of the talents from the kupunas and from uh, the elders. Talents from culinary arts, talents from saddle making, talents from animal husbandry. The mentorship program gives them self-esteem. Mentorship has always been the Hawaiian way of doing things. If you go to our heiaus, the uh, navigation heiau in Mahukona, it was like a school of mentorship. Yeah. And the hula is no different than saddle making. It's someone mentoring you. It's a renaissance now, which is really exciting. And, and people are realizing who we are, you know. What's our origin, yeah? And how can we make it sustainable? When Captain Cook came around the coast of Kohala, he seen more than 30,000 people living in Kohala. Who fed them? We fed ourselves. So our origin in Kohala is that we're sustainable people, we're agrarian. We find ourselves in Kohala as trying to see how we can do small farms and sustain ourselves. A group of organizations has come together to set a goal of being 50% food sustainable in North Kohala. Palili o Kohala is one of these organizations that is providing a place and training for families to learn about natural farming and get on the land. Palili o Kohala means the shoots of Kohala. All of these um, families, these 10 families that are farming, are, are learning to become farmers. They're all part-time farmers now, but we're very confident. We already have 49 acres that we're kind of looking at so we can expand some of our taro. Someday, we look at being 50% food sustainable, and uh, we will. Today, North Kohala has come back from the closing of the sugar industry to be a thriving community focused on becoming self-sustainable, just like it was hundreds of years ago. The population of the area has been growing, and Havi and Kapa'au have become the home of a number of businesses, restaurants, and art galleries that are serving the local community, as well as a robust tourist industry. North Kohala is a unique place, and as it moves into the future, it's important to learn from the past and pass down the ways and values of the kupuna to the next generation. The past will always be part of the future for Kohala. It's, it's more than a sense of place, it's a sense of who we are. It's not just a, a place, it's part of us, and we're part of it. And, and that's what makes, I think, Kohala a very, very special place. And uh, I'm glad that uh, the spirit of our kupuna who, who created this wonderful environment, you know, hundreds of years ago, are still here. And let's, let's all work very hard to make sure that, that that spirit is not going to be lost. It has to be almost like a way of life. We need to preserve our culture. We need to preserve our, 
Aloha spirit. We need support from everyone working together for the coming goal and the coming purpose. And to me, the coming purpose is how do we keep Hawaii, Hawaii? How do we prepare our, our youth to know who they are? And it takes everyone to be part of that. This song was written by Sarah Pule and it was our winning song for ever our, our recording. Our very, very first recording called Sounds from Kohala. This is the song that we want from Stand. 